Welcome to our happy little live stream with our happy little tea and our happy little tea bags. First of all, while everyone is, uh, or before we get started, I guess, can we get a sound check on from everybody? We're going a little bit further away from our mics today, so I wanted to turn up the input to the computer. Want to make sure it's tasting good for all you guys out there. Hopefully not too loud, but also hopefully very, very audible and not distorted at all. You are so audible. Oh, I need to get a little closer, don't I? Hello from Concord, California. First time here. Nice. And he says we sound good. Awesome. Thanks for the feedback, guys. Uh, let's get into it. For those of you who have not been to a Genius Brewing Sunday live stream, our uh, kind of format is we talk about some beer news, some news here at the brewery. Then we go into our beer of the week. And then we talk about uh, a couple of discussion topics. And the topics today are going to be hangover cures. And then if we have time, I'm not saying it's going to because we've got kind of a long list here. If we have time, we will go into how beer skunks and why drinking on the patio may not be your best bet. Ooh, yeah, patio beers. Sounds as beautiful as my mustache thumbnail. Glasses like this are awesome for that, actually. Heck yeah. Um, that would be a terrible idea, actually, getting stainless glasses just for the patio. Yeah. No, that's, yeah. I've said that all along. You said that today. Anyways, let's get into some beer news. Um, uh, beer news. Uh, small craft breweries are feeling the crunch as the road to full reopening uh, might be a lot longer than expected. Yeah, so um, locally here also kind of seems to be around the country. Um, the sort of phased reopening things that, uh, you know, a lot of phases and counties, uh, phases, a lot of states and counties a lot of are, phases. Uh, are putting in place. Um, obviously, if you've, you know, not been living under a rock, uh, COVID-19 is kind of blowing up again. And so a lot of people are, are backpedaling, to say the least, if not even sort of reshutting um, down. Yeah, reshutting down. Um, For example, in Florida, bars are open, alcohol sales not allowed. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. That's well, that's actually hilarious. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so you know, we've definitely been feeling a, a little bit of a pinch ourselves. Um, this week, uh, we got uh, masks were mandated. Um, luckily, we're closed down right now. So Peter and I are good. But uh, yeah, as soon as we open, um, not not only Peter and I, but any customer that comes in also has to wear a mask until they sit down at a table. Which we always kind of um, supported that in the first place. But at the same time, we always mm -hmm. wanted we didn't want to have to be the police. You know what I'm saying? Like that's, yep. that shouldn't be our job. We shouldn't have to be yelling at customers. Cause I know a lot of people have different opinions on that. We always encouraged masks, but now it's like we have to yeah. be the police, which is kind of and an awkward spot. It's for definitely us to um, keeping people from going out is what I've noticed. Um, you know, people, mm -hmm. I think it's just because people feel uncomfortable. And so they're saying, ah, maybe I just won't go out now. Um, so that's kind of an unfortunate situation. And that seems to be the situation across the entire United States. Um, while technically breweries like ourselves are able to, um, remain open um, in some cases. Um, other states, actually, people um, or breweries are considered bars, um, which, um, like another business that Peter has, means that uh, they actually can't reopen at all, um, which is really unfortunate. And, you know, as the time drags on and as this whole situation um, drags on month after month after month, it just gets harder and harder to keep the doors open. Yeah, down there, my only revenue source right now is seeking grants and funding. <laughs> like, let's yep. do a lot of paperwork and see if I can hang on. So, uh, stirring this nice cup around. Um, yep. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so that's kind of the unfortunate situation. Um, but you know, hopefully we will prevail. I know there's some more PPP stuff coming out, um, which <laughs> helps with payroll at least. So, um, so, you know, we'll keep, uh, we'll keep jogging along here and keep doing what we can. Mm -hmm. um, as for news at Genus, uh, we did get a shiny new fermenter. Should yeah, I, I think uh, we put a really low likes goal, like 200 likes on the first one, <laughs> 200 likes and we'll get a new fermenter. <laughs> That yeah, got that 200 was, uh, likes real fast. Yeah, that did not make Michelle happy. <laughs> so we got a new fermenter. So the same uh, fermenter that we just did that review on, the Two Barrel More Beer Pro <laughs> fermenter. If you haven't checked it out, check out that video. Yeah. We have a second one of those now, and I am elated. Which I don't know if I meant – I probably did mention it before, but I was actually very surprised that um, with that tiny little uh, – Glycol chiller the from who? Brew built. It's from the brew built. Like yeah. Ice master max or something like that. Yeah. Icy max or something like that. Um, that chiller actually managed to easily nonetheless uh, get that 
get that down to um, 39 degrees, I think. Yeah, which um, that's, that's good enough. So, yeah, you, and that wasn't the chiller capacity so much as the, uh, I think it was the, the internal pumps. Yeah. Um, if you got a pump that could pump a little bit more uh, volume through it, I definitely think that you could get that all the way down to 34 degrees, which is your proper crashing temp. Yeah, and I think those cooling rods probably are higher resistance than something like a regular jacket that you'd yeah. see on the fermenter. So. But uh, definitely impressive, though, nonetheless, because I'm sure those are tiny little pumps in that chiller. So Yeah. Uh, in other news, we have five sour beers on tap. We love making our sour here at Genus, and we are excited that we have five of them on tap. That wouldn't have been possible before we put in more taps. I don't know if you see behind yeah. us, but yeah, I think uh, Tim snuck in a couple of those too because I, I was out one day and came back in. All of a sudden, I'm like, oh wait, <laughs> we have not two sours, and on. there's we have more. Three, four, oh five. <laughs> So that's fun for yep. us. Customers have uh, been super excited, too. Um, yeah, we're, we're getting kind of known in the area for our sours, and so it's always good to have options for people uh, and kind of a range of options from more aggro sours mm -hmm. to softer, uh, sweeter sours. Uh, we had three birthdays here at Genus over the weekend. Happy birthday to my sister, Logan's son, and Tim's daughter. <laughs> uh, my son was first, right? Well, technically your sister was first but my sister was born before your son <laughs> that is that is true <laughs> that'd be awkward if she wasn't um yeah but anyway everybody apparently has birthdays over the fourth uh so that's kind of a cool thing so and we uh, got to have a, a day off everyone was able to take the fourth off and enjoy some time with the family much needed r and r i think it's really good to kind of get out of this headspace this zone being here all the time and actually get some time with family to relax yep uh, brewed a couple batches of beer this week, too. We got uh, a little small batch of a nice little porter done. And um, a big batch of our Castor Muncher Coffee Kolsch. So yeah, the next so. time we release our Castor Muncher Coffee Kolsch here on tap, we will have plenty of it, and it will last. <sighs> yeah, finally. And it uh, was tasting really good going into the fermenter. So crossing our fingers, that batch is the best to date. Yeah. Uh, what else we got here? Got our logo for our West Coast IPA oh, kits God. done. <laughs> Looking into whether or not there's going to be any copyright issues. You'll find out all about that in a little bit. Um, yeah, and then mask enforcement starts Tuesday, technically. So we're going to just go ahead and probably start early and tell people that that's kind of the new law right now. Yeah, but we got to yell at people. At least we're providing masks. Yeah, so, we so provide masks. So, so if you walk in and you don't have a mask, we, our goal is to not turn you away, yeah. to just tell you to put on one of the masks that we have. Uh, we really, really stocked up to make sure that nobody's like having to be turned away. But yeah, that's my one kind of peeve with like the whole like, all right, everybody's got to do masks and everybody's enforcing it, and then they're not yeah. offering masks. And then yeah, like some people are like chain stores and putting stuff their like that. shirts up, and yeah. you're like, that's not okay. Not the same like, thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like if we've got to inf if you if you've got to enforce wearing a mask, you should at least provide masks so that people that don't have them. Yeah. I mean, because a lot of times, even for me, it's so simple to just forget yes. to bring one with me. Like I have my masks, but oh, yeah. I left it in my car when I was walking here. Or and uh, if you are a business in Spokane County, this is probably a very minority of you. Um, Spokane County is actually offering. Um, uh, mask and other um, safety materials for you. Um, you just have to go on to their website and uh, yeah, they're offering those free of charge. So, so that's nice. Just have to tell them your business and go pick it up the next day. Mask and sanies. All right. I think now it's time for our beer of the week. Ba -ba -ba beer of the week. Do do. Which is a uh, German Wit beer. Style 24A, a wit beer is denoted as being a sort of grainy wheat base, obviously, with a nice smooth creamy body to it and a lot of phenolic spiciness from the yeast. Yeah, so this is the perfect summer style. Um, actually, late summer style, in my opinion. Um, August is screams wit beer to me. Nice hot um, weather beer. Nice hot weather beer. I like the more traditional wit beers that are going to be a little bit drier compared oh, yeah. to the sweeter versions that we do here in America. Sorry, Germany. We, we butcher your beer styles. That's true. And more this, often than this, not, this one, th this one, I even have plans to do a, a late edition or dry hop with. <laughs> on the, on the awesome. So we're going to butcher it either way, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, so otherwise. Uh, Americanized version of a wit beer. <laughs> the overall <laughs> um, breakdown is that, yes, they're going to be um, refreshing with a dry finish. Um, you Like Peter said, the phenolics of the yeast are really what, what are going to shine through. You're going to get um, a lot of notes of like sort of um, – uh, white pepper, um, and then also you're going to get those uh, those finishing aromatics from coriander and orange peel traditionally used. Mm -hmm. um, and so you get this just this really nice, light, very, very flavorful, um, zesty beer to kind of finish off a hot day with. 
very bright beer, but I will also see uh, say that they can be like still smooth and creamy. Um, uh, in the style guidelines, it even denotes that you can add oats to this style of beer to mm -hmm. make sure that it has that creaminess. Uh, but let's talk about our base malt uh, for this style. Uh, this could be about 50% base malt and 50% wheat traditionally, sometimes unmalted wheat if you want that extra proteininess. Uh, but our base malt this week is going to be Halcyon. Halcyon is one that we have used in a variety of very pale beers, actually, and uh, it is, it's a very, very clean malt, um, to say the least. doesn't have quite as much grain, graininess as a lot of like Pilsner malts we've used, um, but at the same time has that nice smoothness to it. Um, yeah, so it's it's got a nice nice creamy smoothness to it. It's just a really good, uh, still very neutral, so it's not aggro like a like a Marisotter will be in terms of the flavors that it comes across with. But the feel and the subtle sweetness yeah. is a perfect base to balance out the more aggressive spicy notes that you're going to get off this style. Yeah, this malt also has a um, really pale color to it. Um, so similar to like Heidelberg malts, like what we've talked about before, um, it is going to have a little bit um, higher enzymatic power, um, probably actually in line with. Uh, other pale two rows might be just slightly higher, um, but you should have plenty of enzymes for when you're adding that extra wheat to it. Yeah. Uh, one way that I think is really going to be nice to kind of spice up this beer a little bit more and kind of create some balance in it is to add some sort of a either a small late uh, wait, late edition or whirlpool edition of hops to it or even a little bit of a dry hop to give you some floral balance to it. And the hop that we picked for this week is German Monroe hops, which we will have some samples coming in this upcoming week. No, we uh, might already have them in. Yeah, that explains why you picked that hop then. You're welcome. I saw that. I was like, uh, do we have Monroe? I've never used that hop before. <laughs> um, but it does sound amazing based on our notes. Um, we got a flavor profile of strawberry, cherry, red currant, passion fruit, and plum. Yeah. Like, is this a hop or a yeast we're talking about? Like, I know. It's got <laughs> a lot of crazy flavors that are supposed to come off of it, but it is low, uh, low-ish total oils, which like we said, that low-ish total oils, those hops often lean into kind of a white wine characteristic, uh, very common with these German hybridizations of uh, popular American hops. So I'm excited to see what this one uh, brings to the table, and I think it's going to be a good subtle hop to balance out a relatively overall not very aggressive profile. Callus called me out too. I said German wood beer. Yeah, you know, he was thinking like pre, what's that, 1930s or whatever <laughs> that the, you know, everything changed? Uh, yeah, I guess it's technically a Belgian wit, but yeah. I mean, there was, there were some things that went down. Yeah, yeah we knew. Yeah, we knew <laughs> what was going on. Uh, but uh, yeah, anyway, back to the hops. Uh, so yeah, let's go on to the yeast, which is uh, a very traditional strain. It's going to be the, uh, the 3944 strain from uh, Y yeast. That's Belgian. Belgian whip beer strain, um, which is going to be your classic strain, and that's really where you're getting all those phenols from, is, is the yeast strain itself. Uh, I mean, you like to say this one, uh, you don't want to ferment too hot, but you can, can ferment on the hot side. We like to say start out in that classic 68 to 70 range, and yeah. then go ahead and towards mid to late fermentation, bump that guy up to 72 to 74 if you can. Um, just to kind of push forward some subtle uh, white pepper and uh, that uh, white pepper style spiciness, but without getting too banana clove uh, phenolic and esterification. Yeah, definitely on the hot side, you can push those closer a little bit too strong, um, which I like my whip beers to be a little more subtle myself. Um, I even consider blending strains, um, blending a more neutral strain with um, a traditional whip strain just so you get more of a more of a subtlety on on that character and or um just over pitching in general yeah um, but yeah like peter said i usually shoot right around that 70 degree mark and uh and that's a good place to start uh, yeah so let's go into the water cam which we're starting to do mm -hmm. on all these styles from now on we will try to get a general water profile in your mind for nailing this style uh, and with a whip beer that's going to be a relatively soft profile uh, again nothing probably over 50 to 60 parts per million and a lot of that will fall between 30 and 50 parts per million um, but a subtle lean towards sodium and chloride now what that's going to do is again help smooth out this mouthfeel Yep. And balance out the fact that this is a highly carbonated beer with phenolics. As Peter would say, the sodium is going to give you that <laughs> character. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a technical term. Yeah. Uh, but no, it's uh, yes. <laughs> sodium is actually a trick that we've used for a lot of um, sort of traditionally softer beers. And it does actually have a, a very large impact on, on the mouthfeel of the beer. Underestimated and overlooked so. mineral. Yep. So, and a little bit goes a long ways too. Really um, does. That, yeah. that is to be said. The I mean, we're between like 10 parts per million and 30 parts per million is like crazy. Yeah. We're talking like for five gallon, you know, your 22 liter batches, whatever they are. Um, we're uh, like eight, an eighth of a teaspoon, which is going to yeah. be like a half a gram to a gram can make a big difference. Yeah. So a tiny, tiny bit, basically a pinch of, of table salt is all you need. 
Um, all right. And so that, I think, pretty much sums up our beer of the week. Yeah. So uh, now for the discussion topic. And this is one that I thought would be fun post 4th of July. Actually, Logan was, it was his idea. Um, but best <laughs> but Peter did most of the we- research. Yeah, I did most of the research. It helped uh, that it's something that I've actually researched a lot before. I wonder why that could be. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, um, yeah, happy fifth, everybody. Happy, yeah, day after I party for America I hope you enjoyed day. all those barley wines last night. <laughs> 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 While half the people watching probably aren't even, <laughs> weren't even celebrating the fourth. But well, anyways, yeah, true. so uh, hangover cures. If you are uh, suffering from some post-party day slash holiday m- m- madness, if your body hates you right now, what are the things that you should be doing uh, to, to help your body recover mm. and help you feel really good? Let's mm. start with... Let's start with uh, some realer myth. I'm going to give Logan a couple of uh, realer myths, and he's going to tell me if he thinks this works to cure a hangover or if it does not work to cure a hangover. Um, probably the most common one, uh, big greasy breakfast. What do you think? I mean, to an extent, yeah, just because food in the belly is always a good thing. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to go ahead and say that big greasy breakfast to cure a hangover is a myth, and that's not something not a lot of you guys are probably not going to. Uh, All right, what about eggs? To like, okay, still. <laughs> eggs, eggs got the thing that absorbs stuff in it. Sure they do. <laughs> Uh, no, so uh, big and greasy food is actually really good before you start drinking. Uh, what big greasy food does for you is it'll actually close off your pyloric valve at the bottom of your stomach, uh, which makes it so that you absorb alcohol through the stomach lining instead of through your intestines, which have high surface area. Uh, and so you absorb alcohol a lot slower, which means your liver doesn't freak out. Uh, that said, the next day, what big greasy food will do is also... Um, uh, close off that pyloric valve, but you'll be absorbing some calories from that big greasy food and your liver will prioritize the calories that you're drinking over the toxins that you produce that are making you feel bad the next day. Well, that's no fun. I know. (laughs) Which brings us to the number two, Uh, Uh, hair of the dog. What do you think? Hair of the dog. Totally true. I mean, that makes it so at least you don't have to feel the hangover that day and you can feel it the next one instead, right? Yeah, just put off your hangover (laughs) for as long as possible. for much the same reason, hair of the dog is also uh, a brewing mi- uh, or a myth. Um, so basically, what happens is your body goes into reabsor- or reprocessing alcohol, uh, and it doesn't get a chance to process the toxins at all. What it does do is because your liver's kind of in freak out mode, is it produces some of the same toxins that made your brain numb the night before when you were over drinking. It makes you care less. It makes you care less because you're yeah. drunk again. It makes you, and, and it also does numb your body. So it, it gives you the feeling as if you're not hungover. But really what you're doing is just carrying that hangover a little bit further. So you want to hear a fun fact? Yeah. Um, hair on the dog, that term actually comes from uh, sort of a spinoff of the, what it, what's the, what's the uh, ailments, something that, about ailments not having more to not kill you. But uh, if you are supposedly bit by a dog, if you take the dog's hair and put it in the bite, it will make it heal faster. That is where that term comes from. Is that true? That is, that's, I don't know. I ran, ran across it. I was like, <laughs> it's a really random one. So that is random. That is, but that is the, uh, that is the truth of the origin of that phrase, at least. <laughs> yeah. Which is completely absurd in modern day, but right. Imagine 300 years ago might, might've made more sense. Just yeah. sleep more. Somebody says. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. Sleep until it's gone. Um, I mean, that's probably also why you're hungover. I mean, I feel hungover every day and that's yeah. sort of a thing. Um, so let's go into when it comes to curing a hangover, what we're looking at is both, first of all, curing the symptoms. The symptoms are going to be like, obviously, dehydration is a big one. Um, you're going you're to be looking at inflammation. That's the thing that makes your body ache. Um, obviously, a headache, which is partly due to inflammation and partly due to toxins that are in your brain at that time. And then you're also looking at, what's the other one? Headache, nausea. Uh, and nausea usually comes from actually still having the spins depending on how much alcohol your liver still has to process. So how do you fix all this stuff? What's the quickest way to get uh, back into drinking shape after a big night out? Uh, not drinking in the first place. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's true. Uh, there, is, there was an article, I don't want to say like five years ago, where uh, the owner, Sam Cock, Cook, Cock. <laughs> Sam Cook from... Uh, uh, Boston Same. Beer Company. Boston Beer Company, yeah. Yeah, um, would actually take teaspoons of yeast uh, and eat that before um, before going out. Which makes sense because vitamin B1, mm-hmm. right? Right. That's so, And that's actually something I have for our hangover cures too is vitamin B. It's really good the night before because it helps your liver process alcohol more cleanly. Mm-hmm. And it's also really good for the day of, uh, especially because a lot of B vitamins come with electrolytes and electrolytes help your body absorb water. Brando. 
Nobody gets that reference. Uh, Peter thinks my jokes are bad. <laughs> yeah, so somebody <laughs> says, uh, drink water. Yes, drink water. Yes. And uh, with th- electrolytes. That is another thing, too. Yeah, that's actually something I, in the in the few bit of research I did, um, uh, yeah, if you drink Pedialyte. basically water in between, you know, every other beer or so, um, then you're much less likely to uh, have a hangover because you won't get nearly as dehydrated. With that said, though, you'll also be um, spending, you know, half of your drinking session in the bathroom because... You'll be peeing a lot. That's true. Uh, and you're not peeing out the alcohol. You're just absorbing it differently. It yep. helps keep your liver in fighting shape. So why why your liver, by the way, why you make a lot of toxins when you get too drunk too fast? Like let's say you're drinking at a good beer pace. I like to drink at beer pace because then I can drink a lot for a long time and not get hung over. Um, but while you're drinking at a good beer pace, let's say you take a couple shots, what happens there and why that gives you a hangover is because it shoots your liver into uh, freak out mode. It's like, wow, there's way too much alcohol in my system way too fast. And it goes from processing alcohol relatively cleanly, only creating a few toxins during the process of getting rid of the alcohol in your body, to processing it very, very fast and inefficiently, in which case it makes a lot of stuff that, uh, uh, first of all, kills brain cells and gives yourself a brain headache. It, gives a, it actually creates inflammation in your brain and then also creates free radicals, uh, which lead to like belly fat and uh, um, basically you just feel like crap the next day. So things that do work to cure hangovers, let's talk about them. Um, ginger, turmeric, and super antioxidants. This works most of the time. Okay. I do have no. I have notes for you now. Oh, you have notes for me now. I have notes. Perfect. Most of the time, uh, yeah, because they're gonna absorb those free radicals <laughs> and reduce your inflammation, which makes sense. You know, if you can get those toxins flushed out a little bit uh, quicker, then you're gonna be feeling better a little faster. And when you reduce that inflammation, obviously your headache goes down a little bit, and your um, uh, body aching goes down a little bit. Um, the only downside to that is a lot of those don't uh, break the seal. They come with uh, uh they come with calories. Uh, and calories, obviously, any simple sugars, your liver is going to prioritize metabolizing those over metabolizing alcohol cleanly, and or metabolizing um, the toxins that it created the night before. So yeah, so there's uh, step one, uh, fasting. Where'd you find that at? Uh, that is something, so th- this also works, but depends on how good your liver is at switching what it processes. Um, so basically the bottom line there is if you're used to intermittent fasting or long distance exercise, your lip, then fasting is probably the quickest way to get rid of a hangover. If you lift instead of doing cardio, and if you eat several times a day, normally your liver is probably not good at switching what it does. And so fasting probably won't work for you and might actually make you hurt really bad. There you go. Um, exercise. Exercise uh, is actually effective from what I know. Yeah. Um, you just hate yourself while you're doing it. Um, and, ag- and again, this is sort of uh, the same thing as uh, like your, your antioxidants. Um, you're just going to kind of bump up that metabolism and you're flushing everything out of your system um, faster than it otherwise would do. Um, like I said, though, you're just not going to feel nice while you're doing it. Yeah. No, it, usually exercise hurts a lot and then sometimes might make, make you puke. Um, but uh, yeah, speaking of things that bump up your metabolism, another thing that is good for you is coffee slash caffeine. Uh, I'm guessing same thing. Bo- Boosts your metabolism, makes your liver work faster, flushes everything, gets rid of yeah, gets rid of everything. So, you know, we got things like coffee that we're drinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I see you've got ibuprofen um, or other NSAIDs, uh, and uh, these we're, kind of are a double-edged sword, though, aren't they? Yeah. Because uh, so these things are going to reduce your inflammation. They might make your headache go away, um, but they're also um, really bad on your liver because your liver is still trying to process out those toxins and now you're throwing something else at it to process. So it kind of, it, it makes it work that much harder. So if you don't have to, it's probably n- not the best idea unless you're really hurting. Yep. Um, yeah. And then I also saw a fantastic comment, which I also came across. Um, and that is actually getting a, some kind of a saline drip or an IV, which I feel yep. like is a little excessive for <laughs> cheating 99% of situations. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's technically the fastest way to rehydrate yourself is oh, just, yeah. just plug it right in. But uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of extreme for sure. I remember my college days when I had to go to that. I mean, that never, ha- I've never experienced that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so that I think sums up uh hangover cures. So all of you out there, I know it's uh, I know it's probably a lot later in the day now, so you're probably already cured of your hangover. But um, yeah, it depends on how hard they went yesterday. Yeah, it depends on how hard. I've had plenty of Fifth of July's. Red would not be good by yeah, now. Yeah, I know. I'm sure like all of those <laughs> Europeans um, that are celebrating the Fourth of July are, are like they're, they're they're way way over their hangover by now. Right? I think we saw a Malian, <laughs> mm, Texas. <laughs> 
So Zach Bullpit definitely feeling it. Uh, why don't we celebrate other countries' holidays? Uh, I feel like we 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 do sometimes. As, as Americans, we're always looking for an excuse to celebrate something, right? That's true. <laughs> well, we can just call St. Patrick's Day an Irish holiday. Uh, we could pretend. I mean, yeah, we do celebrate that, so that's a thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, let's just get right into our next topic, um, and that is um, beer skunking, and uh, in you know sitting out. It's summertime, um, at least in the northern hemisphere. Um, we got patio season. And uh, we got sun. skunky beer. Yeah, so uh, this one actually, what reminded me, yes, when in doubt, sweat it out. Um, yeah, this one, uh, what reminded me of this one was actually uh, last week, I think when uh, Tim's wife was here, mm. and we gave her a beer, which we know is a really good beer, and then she came back in from the patio in like four minutes, and like, this beer tastes funny. Like, I, I, I know you guys make a beer, but what's going on with this? Smelled it. She'd been out there for less than five minutes, probably, and, she, oh, yeah. and I was like, oh, yeah, that's skunked. Yep. He's like, why are you selling skunky beer? And we said, we're not. You were just sitting out in the patio. So how fast does beer skunk, and what makes it skunk? 30 seconds, right? 30 seconds. In direct sunlight, it only takes 30 seconds to produce, um, I believe, perceivable levels of 3 MBT. That was a mouthful, wasn't it? Yeah, so 3-methyl, 2-butyl, 1-thiol uh, Thiol, yeah. um, is uh, what 3-MBT is, and that is that skunky flavor in beer. And basically what it is is a— It's an aroma more than a flavor, but yeah. Right. But, um, I mean, you perceive flavors through what you smell, and yep. it is it is a very pungent, smells like a skunk kind of aroma, and uh, it uh, happens when blue-green light is coming in contact with any sort of hop compound. So any sort of light beer will not mask this very well. So light beers that are only a little bit hoppy, you'll get this flavor really, really fast. And the big one, IPAs. Yep. So IPAs, just because of their sheer amount of um, hop oils in them, uh, they're going to have a lot a lot more skunky character because you got more of that being created when they are exposed to the sun. Um, and yeah, we actually did a video on this. That was, was that two years ago now? Yes. That uh, was Jesus. It was a while ago. Yeah. yeah we did time a video is, talking about, uh, time is flying by. That was when we were still bald. Or I was still bald and you were still clean shaven. Yeah. When we did that. But, um, but, um, um, yeah. So <coughs> if you want to learn more about, um, kind of skunking in general, we actually went really in depth of all the molecular stuff in that video. Um, but as for general advice today, um, you know, now this patio season, you're taking things out. Um, I think a fantastic option is this cup right here, which we still don't have available. Yeah. Otherwise this would be a perfect <laughs> metal cup stuff for the patio. Perfect, perfect plug. But yeah, a metal cup actually, um, or just an opaque cup in general. Um, is going to be fantastic for you to help protect your beer. Yes, you're still going to get sunlight in through the top, um, but now, you know, instead of being... You're reducing the surface. Yeah, instead of a matter on, of yeah. a minute or two, you know, you might actually not get that perceptible skunky character until you're down to the, you know, last little bit of your beer, which you might as well just throw back and yeah. grab a fresh one anyway. <laughs> or, you know, you could just be like me and, like, count that as a, one of those nostalgic flavors that you learned <laughs> to drink growing <laughs> up. And then, uh, you know, start... Heineken Blue Boar? Right, exactly. <laughs> You no, know, not Heineken. Not, yeah, well, Heineken, Henry, well, and Heineken just regular. <laughs> yeah, Heineken. yeah, that was a Freudian thing, right? Yeah, there, it was yeah. like Blue Yeah, I, I did try Blue uh, once. It was insane, insanely sweet. Uh, um, but yeah, next time you're going on the patio, skunky. consider uh, a metal cup or consider drinking a little bit inside. <laughs> and when you take an IPA on the patio, just know that it's gonna be, uh, yeah. it's gonna be skunky. Yeah, you know the stouts? other thing. You can drink stouts. Uh, or, yeah, um, yeah, stouts are not not so hoppy beers. Um, I've actually had plenty of pilsners out on the patio and i generally don't notice a an an excessive amount of skunkiness at least not until i get to the very end of the beer yeah um, and that's just because they're you know the the hop hop uh overall hop load in there is a lot smaller too or so. just drink sours i think the major, the vast majority of our sours yeah. don't have uh enough hops in them or any hops in them so they won't get skunked they're, they're gonna be perfectly yeah. fine out in the patio and they're great patio beers anyway yep so yeah cocktail drinks i love it that'd be a really uh, that'd be a really big cocktail umbrella yeah, no Corona on the patio. <laughs> uh, actually, I think that's funny because I'm pretty sure Corona, uh, uh, that beer, they actually use a um, – they don't use straight hops in it. They actually use um, processed hops so that you don't develop the 3 MBT. Um, so I want to say Corona is I one of the – I think you still get skunks with Corona. I, yeah, I think it was Corona or one of them. There was one of them that they actually – that that they – recognize that and they use something that won't form 3mbt with it so hmm. um yeah they use some kind up. of weird extract compoundy thing uh so uh yeah so corona i think is actually the one that is safe heineken definitely gets super skunky though super super skunky um <laughs> no corona on the patio uh we need to do a corona 19 miler 
Uh, yeah, so otherwise, um, another option would be, you know, you got, you know, we don't, but a lot of places will um, serve in the uh, classic pub glass, or not pub, but uh, shaker glasses. Yeah. Um, and I know you can purchase for dirt cheap or even make your own little, Koozie. little koozies that go on them. Um, so those will help as well. And, uh, you know, when all else fails, go grab a napkin from the bar and wrap it around your pint glass. So, yeah, um, yeah, that's that's sort of the, the ways to mitigate. Uh, we should come up with some beer koozies for our beer. for our uh, um, our glasses. Yeah, we should. Our yeah. Munich glasses. Oh, for those. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would that would be really difficult. We can. Do I it. mean, I'll be impressed. Super but. fancy stemware <laughs> with a nice little koozie on it. Koozie and stemware. I don't believe I've ever seen that before. Well, you're about to. We'll make it happen. Uh, yeah. All right. <clears throat> well, um, I think that kind of sums up our general topic questions uh, or discussion topics. Uh, so let's go ahead and open it up to general questioning now. Um, and uh, I do see somebody that's uh, talking about a wit beer already. Um, they did Blue Moon clone. Didn't add enough dried orange peel, though. Uh, three grams instead of three ounces. Oh that yeah, it's quite a bit less. That you probably don't need three ounces, but you know somewhere between that one and two ounces is fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean you can either boil it up in some water. The dried orange peel that you usually get is meant to be boiled, yeah, you know, to break down a little bit. Uh, but if you want a really intense orange flavor, I would say just either use peel, like fresh peel, That's um, or you can get your the rest of your dried orange peel into a cup of vodka, soak it for you know an hour or two, shake it up. And then pour that whole thing into your secondary. Yeah, I would <clears> say <throat> if you still got beer in the fermenter, just uh, kind of spray some star sand or whatever sanitizer you got on hand on a, on a nice fresh orange and then just zest that straight into the fermenter. Um, leave it sit for a day or two and then keg that up, and I think you'll actually be really happy with that result. Um, and then so I saw another question. Had bottle bombs yesterday yeah, in the closet. Followed priming calculators. Had a mix of amber and clear bottles available. Only the clear bottles exploded. Ambers were open and it had no problems. Thoughts? Interesting. Interesting, interesting. Um, have you have you cracked one of the ambers yet? Because I'm wondering if maybe the clear bottles just weren't as strong as the ambers. That would be uh, that that would be my first guess. <laughs> uh, slowly open one oh, of yeah, the no, ambers. Oh, yeah, no. She said it opened and had no problems. Oh, okay. Um, so the only other thing that I could think of that would happen was the extra light and or heat catalyzed a fermentation or some sort of reaction in the bottles. Um, I would wonder if it was dry hopped or not. Um, Super weird, yeah. But yeah, it would have to be extra fermentation. So what what my bet would be, usually when you get that, is that uh, some um, some extra fermentation, either from infection or from the being bottled slightly too soon, uh, was catalyzed through the extra energy put into from the heat or heat from the clear bottles absorbing UV light. Yeah. Um, that is super And the weird. amber bottles just didn't have time to do that. So if you let the amber bottles sit for long enough, they might do the same thing. Yep. But those would be my two guesses as to what happened there. Yep. Um, as to answer your question, Urban Outcast, <laughs> um, skunky beer should not smell like wet dog. That's that's a different thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that is a different thing. That is a very different thing altogether. Uh, yeah, I mean. Wet dog is usually oxidation or still some sort of like a, can sometimes be a petio infection. Yeah. But a lot sometimes of times it's. Sometimes bread if it's really young too. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, usually it's uh, the most common wet dog is some sort of oxidation. Yep. Um, Add salt, CC, and jip to the sparge water or in the boil. Uh, uh, it shouldn't really mm -hmm. matter. Uh, I add it to my mash actually. Yeah, I was gonna say we usually add to the mash. And um, I just calculate out to the full volume of my final beer. Sparge water is probably a better way to go if you're gonna use it. Um, it actually. Your, your mashes really like to have lots of dissolved calcium ions. Um, that's one thing we make sure to tell customers if they're ever building up a water profile from scratch, you know, if you're using distilled or RO water, um, is make sure you've got those calcium um, ions in there because those actually are essential to getting conversion. And that's why um, we'll usually add all of our water salts directly to our mash just because um, you know, the more the merrier when it comes to your calcium in the mash. Um, so that's kind of why, you know, the boil your Yes, you're going to have that same influence on the beer itself, but you, you're not going to get that extra benefit from adding it directly to your mash. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I think that's that question. And uh, are you looking at uh, Keptanis right now? Yep. No, yes. we have not considered it. Uh, Lithuanian-style Lithuanian farmhouse sales with the kept in it. So someone oh, said, yeah. thinking about baking my mash ton a while, y'all considering kept in it, kept in it, 
Uh, so it was misspelled. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's something I, I haven't looked into. We weren't considering it until now because <laughs> we always love playing with new yeast. Um, yeah, we've had, uh, we got a few fun, fun new ones in. It's a little known Lithuanian style of beer where the mash is baked in the oven. The first ever farmhouse brewer. Uh, oh yeah. You could totally do that. Yeah. So you'd actually probably get some, so obviously if it's baked in the oven, you get some stratification in your mash itself, uh, depending on your water levels. Uh, you might actually get some extra Maillard on the very top and or bottom of your um, of your mash. But, yeah, it's not something we've really looked into. <laughs> uh, UK, they serve Corona with a lime. They serve Corona with a lime everywhere. It's just to give it flavor. <laughs> and hide the bad flavor. <laughs> and hide the bad flavor. Actually, it's not, it's not that terrible. Uh, there's definitely worse out there. What are your thoughts on serving beer directly out of a pressurizable fermentation vessel like the Firmzilla or All Rounder? Uh, uh, that's absolutely fine. Yeah, ain't um, nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I mean, you save yourself a vessel. The Firmzilla is nice because it has that floating ball, which means that you're not getting yeah. all the trouble on the bottom until the very last little bit. It's like that, my friend, is called Cascale. Yeah. Uh, I mean, honestly, it pretty much is Cascale, um, depending on what you're serving it at, I guess. But Right, yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, real ale, to say the least. Um, yeah, and that's actually a practice that's been done for a long, long time. So it's there's the easiest way to CO two beer. Yeah, unless you plan on like having the beer on tap forever. Um, yeah, I don't th- see anything wrong with that. You know, with that said, if you got that thing on tap for like three months, four months, and your yeast starts dying, then that might be a different situation. Uh, so uh, anyway, let's go on to the next one. Uh, oh, uh, in continuation of the somebody asking about the uh, water chem to sparge slash boil, uh, we add all of our water chem to the mash. Um, so we calculate out for what we'll be sparging with, and then we add it to the uh, mash. The only reason to add some to your sparge water is if you are concerned uh, that sparge water will over alkalinize, will be too alkaline for your, uh, for your mash. So if you've got like, I don't know, really high bicarbonate or something like that, you might consider just acidifying your sparge water. Yeah. But in terms of the water cam, that should all be water soluble and should end up in your beer regardless. Uh, I wouldn't add it to the boil um, just because it, it's just as easy, easy to add it to the mash. You're not missing yeah. out on anything. But I would calculate out your entire water cam for what you need for your full volume and then add that all into the mash. Yep. Or you could do it like in your general strike water too. That's fine. Yeah. Um, uh, somebody's asking uh, Aoster. <coughs> Uh, is asking about 3944 versus T58, which is a fermentous yeast strain, um, and how they compare to each other. And I would say, um, kind of like you actually mentioned in your comment, our, my experience is that they are very similar to each other. Um, I'm, I feel like they're are, they're not the exact same strain, are they? They're not. For, yeah, I was going to say they are. I know T58 is uh, a little bit fruitier, like a little bit Belgian fruitier. Um, they can yeah. both make that same base, like peppery. Uh, peppery whip beer kind of flavor uh the 3944 will be uh, a better shot at being clean and then peppery and the 258 might be a little bit belgian leaning and then all those same whip beer peppery yeah so. i think both strains would make a fantastic whip beer though um you probably wouldn't notice much of a difference unless you actually did a side by side with them i think they, they are similar enough there um but yeah both of them fantastic strains um the t58 i want to say might want to drop a little bit faster for you so if you're looking for a beer that that uh, cleans up and drop Sprite for you, then then maybe go the T58 over the 3944, but otherwise hard to go wrong. Um, ben Wilson, ever adjust pH after fermentation? I heard a lower pH in IPAs helps hop the hops pop more. Uh, we do that all the time, mostly mm. because we also will sour post-fermentation sometimes, so we'll actually yeah. add lactic acid or other acids to create sour flavors. Um, we don't usually do that in IPAs. We usually plan on that on the front end with acid malts. Um, that said, uh, it wouldn't hurt anything to pop those hops a little bit more with some lactic acid. And if you end up with a little bit of sour flavor yeah. from it, it's going to be fine. Yeah. I don't, so I don't agree with the term popping the hops more, um, so much as, uh, changes what flavors come through. Right. Um, and that's really what the, the change in the pH is going to do. Um, where if you're doing more of a West coast IPA, for instance, and you're trying to go for more of those, uh, those pine tree notes, those those uh sort of grapefruit notes the 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 catty dankness that you might get off some of those west coast hops um that's where having a little bit higher ph is probably going to actually benefit you um whereas if you're actually trying to push through uh, more of those pineapple notes more of those lemon zest notes um, the natural drop in acidity can actually take um, honestly the same hop variety um, let's just take centennial and turn it from more of a grapefruit um, note into into more of that sort of lemon zesty note so 
Um, um, that that's that's the reality there. A lot of people will actually uh, one of the purposes of dry hopping. Sometimes if your pH, pH is also too low and you want some more of those fruity flavors out, out of it, is that dry hopping actually raises your pH and so it kind of gives a different play on the balance. So yeah, it does actually. That that's true and that's also what kind of helps with the uh, sharpness of a beer too. So that's why if you ever taste a beer before you dry hop it and then taste it again afterwards and you're like this seems like a little bit drier and and more bitter now. It's because of the dry hop increasing the pH. So Someone just kegged a beer with Huel Melon. It was a smash. Uh, two row pale, two ounces of Huel Melon in Whirlpool, and then three ounces of Huel Melon as a dry hop. Have we ever brewed with Huel Melon? That uh, is a lot of Huel Melon. That is. It's only five ounces, so it's not going to be. It'll be like a nice yeah. pale Huel beer. Huel. Um, yeah, we have. Uh, Huel Melon's one, one of those ones that's uh, in that still German pedigree yeah. where it's you know hybridized from other hop sources. And uh, it's nice because it has that low total oil content relative to something really big like Mosaic here in America. And sometimes comes across in that white winey characteristic with notes of things like melon uh, and then citrus. Um, so I don't expect that to be a very big flavor that you'll get from it. Yeah, I that's, think it to be that's what I was going to say. Yeah, is don't expect this thing to be like a classic, you know, West Coast pale ale or anything like that. Um, it's going to be subtle. It's going to be a really easy beer. Hopefully on the grain bill, you went nice, light and simple. Um, just to let that hop shine through. Otherwise, you're probably not going to get much out of it. Um, even with adding five ounces in there, um, it might seem like a lot to you. But, but yeah, it, it is a subtle hop in our experience. Um, do we use quike yeast for commercial brewing? You <laughs> sure bet? You, we nope, bet sure you never do. Never once <laughs> in the last four days. <laughs> yeah, we use it all the time. Um, quike yeast is really nice because you don't have to use very much of it, which means if we didn't do a starter, we're probably making the beer with quike. Uh, or if we want it done really quickly, if we're running out of fermentation space and need to brew a lot of beer really quickly, we're probably using Quike. Yeah, uh, mostly we've used it. So we do have one large fermenter here that's actually not even ours. Um, and uh, mostly the reason for using Quike uh, is that one is, a, is really difficult. We don't have like a dedicated um, temp control system for it. So we either have to swap one out from one of our other fermenters or rig up some kind of like weird janky water cooling system. Yep. Um, so that's, that's kind of been our, our go-to for like, hey, you know, we need, a, we need another Quike. All right, let's, let's do it. Like throw it in that one. Right. Um, and also then we we're just doing a large uh, raw ale too. Yeah. Um, so because it doesn't have to cool down as much. Yep. Makes and it and it'll free rise in that fermenter all the way up to 100. Yeah. Um, and it's actually weird. It seems to self-regulate at 100. I think that's probably sort of push the, pushes the limits of that yeast strain. Yep. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think it actually just kind of slows itself down once it gets super, super hot. Um, but, yeah, the beers have actually always turned out very drinkable. So, um, uh, Billy Feathers is here for the hangover cures. Send help, please. Uh, well, Billy, <laughs> step one is going to be a B vitamin with electrolytes in it. Step two is going to be water or electrolytes or water, or like, I don't know, Gatorade or sugar-free Gatorade, something like that. Uh, step three is going to be something that's in the antioxidant realm, like turmeric and ginger. I like those little naked juices. Uh, step four would be st stop eating as much as you want to. Just don't. And then uh, <laughs> what else yeah. do we have? Stop eating. Caffeine. Caffeine. Take a caffeine pill. Caffeine, hydration, Go for a vitamins. nice long walk. It's going to hurt, but it'll get the job done yeah. by the time you're done. Go do like a uh, five-minute mile. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> A five-minute mile? Like yeah. anyone can just do that? Yeah, everyone should be able to just go do that. Um, you can do it. I have faith in you. Uh, <laughs> uh, somebody's asking about Blue Moon and whether or not it's considered a wit beer. Uh, I think it, it is technically considered a wit beer. Um, but it's definitely that's kind of was our, overly sweet was our joke about yeah the bastardized american versions um it is way way too sweet um per style guidelines um so yeah i would not use that as as a reference point i would definitely go try to get some uh some more traditional wit beer um get like a uh like the vine stefan or something like that um see if you can find any of that as long as it's halfway fresh that might be the the trick where depending on where you live in the world Hey, Oster, another yeast question. Mm. Have you tried the Philly Sour yet? No, we have not, but we will love. We would love to, slash I have some Yeah, we'll order. let everybody know once we can get some of that in. You I know, do we're, have it on order. Yeah, we're always – oh, you did get it on order. Nice. I was going to say, we're always looking for I new strains. I order strain, everything. So it makes Logan super happy. We're, we pretty much – I mean, it's all on Josh now, so. That's true. <laughs> He's the one you got to uh, gotta go to. So are all these new items? Mm. Yeah, we only have 50,000 items in inventory so far. <laughs> Why not add another 100? Uh, all right so uh somebody's asking about uh brewing any kind of a beer recipe without hops 
Um, he says hops are too difficult to find and in his country so there's lots of styles without hops uh any sours we brew sours all the time most sours yeah. don't need hops yep so that's that's what i would say is you know you're just looking at sour beer um which means or that grew it yeah, or brag sour it. grew it um you can do yeah there's there's a ton of different herbs that might actually be good for a whole nother live stream now herbs that can take the place of sours herbs herbs, that, or herbs, hops. herbs instead of hops yeah um lots of lots of ways to get there the beer itself obviously isn't going to taste quite the same um, but yeah, sours are kind of my first go-to on that just because you can get some really, really tasty sours with zero hops. And they taste super duper good. Are there any beer styles we have yet to brew? Probably. Yeah. No, there's been a ton, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, we have, I know we have not brewed a, uh, Piro, Piwo Gwad, Gwadzowski. <laughs> We've had some though. Grudzits, Grudzitski. Grudzitski. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, there's there's definitely – I'm sure there there is a good handful. We have probably worked our way, at least per, per beer judging certification. Um, through the vast majority through, of them. Through probably, yeah, a good good 85%, 90%. But, yeah, there's there's definitely some styles that we have not, not brewed or at least not purposely sat down and said, yeah. hey, we're going to nail this style. And there's always, like, um, historical styles that people are digging out that we haven't heard about yet or haven't yep. uh, come across yet, like the one that someone just mentioned earlier. For sure, yeah. The uh, – kept in us so that's a style we haven't brewed i don't think we've brewed it a, a gaz yet yeah we have oh we have i have uh, uh, well not here as a commercial brewery yeah that's what I was thinking. other than using acid malt or good belly can you recommend any simple sources for lacto when kettle souring uh the next uh will it beer will come up and that will be in that um yogurt any probiotic that cultures been out yesterday dang it it's all right we're, all we're getting into you guys it's, we're getting it. it's pretty much ready to go <clears throat> um but yeah, you gotta. Whenever you're using any like probiotics or yogurt or mixed cultures, make sure you're taking a look at which bacteria made the yogurt, because some bacteria are more prone to creating butyric acid and off flavors. Uh, some uh, of the same bacteria will also uh, co-ferment, or they'll be uh, heterofermentive, meaning they will produce alcohol and lacto and lactic acid at the same time. Which means if you're going to bring that back up to boil, you just wasted a lot of alcohol. Uh, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, don't don't get butyric acid in your beer. For the for the love of God, please. Yeah, <laughs> that that is the worst thing you can possibly do. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Any th so, but there's a lot of like Nancy's yogurt works fine. Uh, yeah, Good Belly, uh, or just a lacto pitch too. Yeah, or just or just buy lacto. I like the Y East lactose flavor profile. Lacto. It, uh, it does tend to have a really long shelf life on it, so that's the nice thing about lacto. Is I've used lacto that's been in the fridge for six months and it seems to snap right out of it and do its thing. What temperature slash uh, length of time do you recommend for maximum value slash flavor and flame outs to and whirlpool to maximize expensive uh, aromas and hoppy beer? Tried 30 minutes at 170 was a good result. Uh, we'll actually probably do a, a split between like flame out down to 190 ish and then 190 down to 160 ish, yeah. somewhere in that range. And about 10 to 15 minutes a piece is probably good. So if it takes you, if you can ideally take 30 minutes to go from flame from 212 from boiling temperature down to 160 adding one hop addition right away like let's say two plus ounces and then adding another hop addition right around that 190 range uh, another two plus ounces of really good fresh quality hops that's the real key yep yeah and definitely <clears throat> and, you, and you do skirt a line you know if you go too long and so so there's a combination if you if say you're throwing a half pound of hops in at a whirlpool which is which is a pretty substantial amount um you do definitely skirt a line of pulling as much flavor as possible out of them. Um, with that said, as you start going longer and longer, you're also pu pulling some of those chlorophyll, those plant-like uh, flavors from them as well. So if you end up doing, say, a 45-minute steep with those guys, um, you might start to get some of that like weird kind of plant aggressi aggressiveness in there. Um, so you just kind of have to walk that line. I think I think 30 minutes is probably a a, a good number to shoot for to get it down to a cold temperature. I wouldn't try to go any more than that. Um, uh. Do we know when Lalam and Wild Brew Philly Sour uh, will be available in homebrew packs? I believe it already is. Uh, yeah, should be. And uh, somebody's asking about if we brewed with uh, spruce infused beers, and I don't believe we have. We've used some juniper berries. I mean, we've um, uh, we we did spruce infused beers with a collab with Thomas. Yes, we did. 
do that. Actually, I don't think that was spruce, was it? Yeah, no, he uses spruce. All the, that's what he always oh. uses because of uh, vitamin C. So he had uh, um, basically what he did is he took a lot of the spruce and threw it in the last 15 minutes of the boil. Uh, personally, when we've done it. We've done it uh, whirlpool, but his rationale for doing it in the boil is uh, it does a better job of breaking down the cell walls and the needles and actually extracting vitamin C. Yeah. We um, spruce, you got to actually go and look for a little bit around here, but maybe maybe next year, maybe we'll have enough time next year to actually uh, go out in the springtime and and uh, head north of town a little bit and get some spruce tips, and then uh, we'll do some some spruce tips, and we'll throw in some juniper berries, and then we'll uh, finally make our uh, make our tips and berries beer. So, um, doing a party guile, any hesitation on adjusting water chem from the first wort to the second wort? Uh, the biggest thing would be acidify your sparge yeah. water going into the second wort, and then when you do the runoff there, uh, go ahead and you can add some more water chem depending on the style. Um, if it's going to be brown, you can go ahead and yeet it. Like throw a lot of uh, yeah. That'd be the only it. thing I would say as yeah, is, is maybe throw a little acid at that second sparge, just because I have had a party guile where I did a, a barley wine or not barley wine uh, imperial stout that yeah. I party guiled, and I tried to get uh, sort of Irish dry stout out of the the second batch, um, and it did turn out with with a little bit of tannins, and that's that's the only occasion I've ever had tannins from a beer, and I think it was just that sort of over sparging situation. Yep. So. How much ascorbic acid do we add to a five-gallon batch, and when do we recommend adding it? We do three to five grams per five-gallon batch. Uh, the technically right answer to when to add it is right before packaging. When we add it is in our mash. Perfect. Um, heather beer. Yes, we should probably do a heather beer. Heather beer is a really good uh, wintertime thing. Uh, I definitely would add that to, like, uh, honestly, I think, like, a nice English old ale. With some heather would be really good. Oh, yeah. I think that would just like meld perfectly. I think an old ale would be sweet with, with all that. Um, but yeah, otherwise heather does work really well with beer. Um, I think some people are. Isn't heather like nasty for some people though? I want to uh, say van, uh, no werewolves. Werewolves don't like it. Yeah. Or is it? Or is that one of the pregnant women one? <laughs> same thing. There, there's a few. It's about the same. There's thing. There's a few things that I always laugh. We get these ingredients and it's like you sh if you're pregnant, you shouldn't be consuming this. <laughs> As we're putting it in beer, uh, so uh, I say once a month, both of them turn on the full moon or something like that, right? Oh, Jesus, that's the that's the joke. Uh, I'm kidding. I'm trying to make sure my yeast convert my original gravity of I'm guessing that's 1088 to alcohol. Uh, can I get suggestions on how to make sure it doesn't stall? Um, yeah, nutrient and energizer during fermentation. So nutrient vitamin, I pr I pr per personally add um, about halfway to two thirds through sugar depletion. Um, when it's two thirds of the way done fermenting. Uh, if you really want to make sure that beer finish is dry, a little enzyme, uh, amyloglucosidase, uh, also known as glucoamylase, could be added at the same time. And then always a good shot of oxygen right at the very beginning. Yeah, good shot so, of oxygen, big old yeast pitch. Yeah, yeah, either either with straight O2 or if you don't have that, shaking the living daylights out of it. So um, that should get you where you want to be, though. Um, Luke is asking us uh, what the next uh, brewing craze trend in the U.S. is. Uh, I think the next brewing craze trend is uh, is selling your beer in cans. <laughs> I think it's going to – honestly, I think the next uh, trend that we're going to see a lot of people going towards is – and we're already seeing it right now, but bigger, sweeter beers. I think we're going towards yeah. flavored beers. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense because it's a good hybridization, a good crossover between the beer yep. world and the wine cooler world or the um, – you know, all the other non-beer yeah. – items that people love i world. think it's tough to say because i feel like this summer is almost blown for that now um but i think for next year we're either going to go two routes <coughs> um and we might go both routes at the same time because um you are seeing the seltzers coming out but that's that seems to be the big guys are really hitting the seltzers hard um and so um i feel like as the the big guys hit the seltzer hard seltzers hard the um smaller guys all little craft breweries um, I feel like kind of milkshake quikes because quike is definitely that's be, that's going to become a household term within the next year for sure. A lot of breweries and, are going to uh, make that a trend just because it's just because it's so easy. Yeah, <laughs> it's so easy to do. Uh, and then yeah, doing doing sort of the milkshake milkshake style IPAs, um, throwing in a bunch of lactose because that also makes the beer more expensive. And I don't know why people think that's kind of a cool thing too. But yeah, you end up with a big, super fruity, super sweet beer. And uh, people tend to like those kind of beers. So, Ledgerill89 wonders, is he Smithy the only beers. human that loves smoked beers? The answer is no, you're not. Uh, but there are very few people that do, which means that as a 
from from a business standpoint, you're you're not going to find them very often at a brewery. There's a brewery in Austin, um, Texas, Texas that only does smoked beers. Yeah, yeah, you got to really carve out a niche. I mean, even sours yeah. um, are still a pretty niche market, unfortunately, because they are fantastic beer styles. Um, we definitely blow some people's minds with them here. Uh, uh, Billy Feathers, I brewed an IPA with Chinook for Bittering, <laughs> Centennial, Eldorado, and Amarillo for flavor slash dry hops. <laughs> brewed it twice, but the pr- flavor profile seems clouded. Any tips? Um, I would move the Chinook to the back end. I would take a look at your um, recipe and make sure that the malt is nice and dry. I would split the Amarillo and Eldorado for uh, the late edition slash Whirlpool, and I would dry hop with the Centennial and Amarillo. Yeah. Sour seltzers. I, I, so I was just looking that around a for a pencil because I'm yeah. like, no, I got to take a note of this. That's that, that's our next be, small yeah. batch beer right there. For sure. <laughs> Uh, yeah, because that just sounds that sounds cra- just crazy enough to actually work. Oh, a lot of people saying video stalled. I wonder if that is. Oh, nope, it did. We knew that was gonna happen. The camera di- camera died, didn't it? Did the camera die? They can probably still hear our audio, can't they? They should be able to still hear. Yeah. Our audio. <laughs> uh, sorry, I think the battery died in the uh, in the camera. Should have plugged it in, Logan. I asked you. You're trying to be lazy. Uh. See if that helps at all. Now we're probably going to have to reset everything. We'll see. We're back on. Well, I mean, it's it's up in front of me, so I'll be able to see if we're back on here in a second. Uh, it's probably going to screw everything up, though. <laughs> yep. Yep, everybody can still hear us. So don't mind us. You're just going to be staring at a frozen screen here <laughs> until we can uh, reset up the camera because we did not have it uh, plugged into the wall this time. Yep, you get. Hey, look at that. Um, oh, yes, yeah, jail time. <laughs> Should be probably. Hey, we're good. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. So let's uh, go ahead and answer a few more questions now, since uh, we're we're back up and running, and uh, and then we will probably shut this guy down for the day. Um, hey, everybody that's on, go ahead and give us a like now that we've got that sorted out, because you know. We're we're okay, people. At least I like. We lost think. twenty people during the during the video thing out. <laughs> Sour seltzer. Any seltzer advert? Audio is good. No worries. It's all we need is audio. Speaking of which, excellent audio today, guys. Ah, oh, thanks, guys. Speaking off mic and up close, you both were clean, clear, and with even volume. Did you add? So another the compression. Uh, we kept the compression where it was before. What I did is I upped the line that went from the mixer into the computer, which is something I didn't know I can do until a couple days ago. A.K.A. A random side note. Uh, random side note. Yeah, look at Sock that. Sock Goblin, we have been liked. Thank you, Sock, Go- Sock Goblin. We appreciate the like. Mm. Have we ever smoked our own malt? We sure have. Logan did a video on it, like our third video that I we ever we made. we could redo that, too, now that we actually have half-decent camera equipment. <laughs> yeah, we should redo it. There's a lot we, of our early we videos talked that about we redo. Doing that, except for now, we're probably going to have a burn ban. We were going to shoot an epic video around a fire talking about smoked malt. Yeah. That might have to wait now. We live in a very fire-prone area, for those of you that obviously don't live around here. Someone uh, made a smoked beer with fish. That is what I heard the original, was it, <laughs> no. was it Alaskan Brewing Company that did that? Or was it uh, the Sun one uh, that did that up in, uh, one of the breweries up in Alaska. Yeah. Um, uh, and they actually did that. What they did is they, uh, they smoked fish over it, and then the oil droppings from the fish during the smoking process they captured, and they uh, infused that with their malts. And then they, those malts went into the beer. And it turned out okay. But, hey, oyster stouts are a thing, so why not smoke, smoked fish beer? I mean, I might be getting some sake here in a couple of weeks. so Let's try it. <laughs> we can do it. We can do it for the next bowl of beer. <laughs> um, I am about to brew a Belgian double. Any tips for that style? Uh, candy sugar is king. Yep. Candy sugar to dry it out. Uh, take care of your yeast. That's another big beer. And keep the recipe uh, really simple. Keep the recipe simple, yeah. Maybe a long extended boil. Yeah. So that's, that's about A little bit of aromatical, aromatical malt. <laughs> Uh, any chance those sweet genus tumblers are going to be on the shop soon? No idea. <laughs> oh yeah, these tumblers. I'm I'm gonna get that a was quote. Made, that was made by a person and not a company, so it's kind of no, hard it's a to company. see. Well, it's made by a small person. A small. Yeah. No, I'm pretty sure they're normal size. Elvin. <laughs> they're gnomes. His name is John. It's a shoe cobbler. It's made by a shoe cobbler. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we're we're going to get a quote. We do know them, so we might get a family discount. We'll see. 
We're, we're yeah, good. We got to make sure we get them at a decent price point for you guys, though. Yeah, if the if the cost ends up being too oh, high and the logistics of it, because we have to also count in the logistics of us packaging and shipping. Um, so yeah, we'll see. But maybe if you buy one of our uh, homebrew kits, we can we can always throw them in there. Speaking of which, West Coast IPA up on our website if you want one. It's Available amazing. now. It's amaze balls. Uh, all right. Someone says just started what just so see bleh. Someone is new to brewing and wonders what advice we have for a Belgian triple. First of all, yeast health is going to be king. High alcohol beers are notoriously more difficult for new homebrewers. Uh, I re recommend getting into yeast starters right off the bat. Uh, I recommend making sure you're using yeast nutrients, and I recommend having some sort of oxygen source. Yeah, and even for that one in particular, um, having temp control that you can actually do like a ramped fermentation on is probably a good idea. Um, basically starting out a little bit colder and ramping it up as the fermentation um, kind of continues through. Yep. Uh, All right. Someone wants to do a barley wine for Christmas. Is it too late? No, it's not. Nope. That's, yeah, that's usually actually what I, what I used to do anyway. I used to brew a barley wine on the longest day of the year, and I used to brew a uh, imperial stout on the shortest day of the year. Just because beers like age and can handle a lot of age doesn't always me make, mean they're going to be perfect with the most age sometimes beers that are supposed to take age are great between three and six months yeah and sometimes they take you know six to 12 months or longer it, it just kind of depends uh barley wines are relatively simple so as long as you're taking really good care of your yeast um and you have some time to let the fusel alcohol settle down they should be fine yeah while, while it might age gracefully for you know a couple years um there's no reason why it shouldn't be drinkable after you know just maybe three months four months so uh, yeah, definitely. I, w I would say, yeah, go for it. Drink some on Christmas. Maybe save some for the next Christmas. So Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I think that's about it. That should sum up our live stream. Um, we're going to call it. we got to get opened here. But thank you, everyone, for tuning in, especially after um, the uh, U.S. holiday yesterday. Um, let me uh, – let we'll see you next week at 8.45 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh like and subscribe as always. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye.